thank you guys for coming back to another Respect Project talk with these incredible human beings. The most amazing part of doing these talks is they don't usually know each other. I know some of them and we all sort of show up for each other to have an honest communication with each other based on different topics. And this, this uh, day is gonna be dedicated to the topic of keeping the faith, which to me is really a very vague topic. I don't know exactly why I chose it, but as I delved a little bit deeper inside myself, why I wanted to talk about it, I started to think a little bit about um, an author named Viktor Frankl, who wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he also wrote a book called, what is it, Diane Gray? It's called Say Yes to Life. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he lived in uh, during the Second World War and he was in a concentration camp and he wrote Man's Search for Meaning at that time. And not to get into a sort of dark place, but just to say he discovered that it is possible to find meaning always. And so that to him was what faith was. So as I was talking to all of these wonderful people who are here with us today, I said, that's really more what I'm trying to hit on is not what is our faith and what do we believe in from a faith point of view, but how do we cultivate meaning in our life and how do we share that and inspire that with each other? Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce everybody. Sulai Hinoa is a very good friend of mine. She's an actress. She's the founder of a lifestyle brand called Modern Muse. It's dedicated to empowering diverse women in the four pillars of, I guess, all of our lives, which is our soul, society, sex, and science. Um, <laughs> Kelly Hugh is a friend, also an actress, a speaker, an activist, and she is the founder of a t-shirt brand called 33 Edge, which is dedicated to starting a conversation about unity, diversity, and equality. Another badass. <laughs> Peter Arthur is a dear friend. He's been on these talks many times. He's a bioengineer and also a retired veteran of our United States Army. Jeremy Courtney is one of the founders, co-founder of an organization called the Preemptive Love Coalition. As you guys wrap this up with us, you've got to check out his documentary called Love Anyway. I mean, it is just the point of all of this and this conversation completely. Diane Gray, also a friend. She is a public speaker. She is a grief counselor, doula, educated not only academically, but also spiritually. And I guess what that means, and I'll look forward to getting into that with you, Diane, but when I say you're a grief doula and you help people move through their grief, or if they're dying, move through that, you actually say that you're more about life affirmation and about making helping people to live fully uh, in spite of what they're going through. So a grief duel is just the beginning of the conversation, really. Kelly Wolf is a life coach, a motivational speaker, an actress, and um, Malik Yoba may be joining us. He is also an activist, an actor, a published author, and just an incredible producer. Um, and so without further ado, I wanted to read to you guys a quote from Man's Search for Meaning. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And so I guess this conversation about finding our meaning and our purpose, I would just start with Peter because you've you know been through quite a lot lately in the last two years of our friendship and you never cease to amaze me how you do always go to the light, you always find that positivity no matter what. And we were talking this morning about the question of, have you ever hit rock bottom? And how have you picked yourself up from that and anchored yourself back into purpose and meaning? Um, so I'd love to start with you today. Let me unmute, thank you. <laughs> so I appreciate that and, um, and thank you for having me. Um, and. Um, for those who were not aware, uh, I was involved in a, a pretty uh, horrific accident, and uh, which left me with an amputation. And um, two years later, I'm still going through uh, rehab. But to that point about rock bottom, um, the accident actually wasn't rock bottom in my life, as most people would assume. Um, one thing I learned is that rock bottom is pretty relative. Um, when I was younger, I had this idea that I lost faith in things, but I realized, you know, as I'm older, 
I didn't really lose faith in any, everything. I, I kind of misplaced it, if you will. Um, when you're younger, you have so much passion and then you, you put it into something and when it doesn't work out, uh, you, you throw it aside. And when I'm older, I can say, I can walk back out of my backyard and find that thing I misplaced, which is, for instance, if I misplaced faith in, um, in marriage, what let's say that. Um, it was misplaced because I had, I came with these ideals that I put in there. And when I reorient myself, I realized that, you know what, maybe I need to put it in its right perspective. So maybe I could put it on a different mantle and maybe I could put it on the mantle that I have to learn a little bit about myself and then I can put a little bit more into the institution of it. Um, I had a misplaced idea about um, friendships. Maybe I don't have to lose faith in friendships because a friend let me down. Maybe I can bring that back in and put it on the mantle and learning that I can build my judgment better. And maybe I can build increase my boundaries. Maybe I can be a little bit more retro reflective. So I think losing faith, I think it's, it's, a, it's a passion filled term to me. And I think misplacing it and then having some inward reflection and reoriented is what's important. I really, I appreciate what you're saying. It was one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about, which is a famous writer, Rainer Maria Rilke. He said that we're living the question and I think that the people who are willing to grow the most are willing to become the most uncomfortable or if they're uncomfortable or they're lost or they've misplaced something or they have doubt that they're willing to dive into that to get to the other side. Um, and so I would think Diane, that's something to talk about a little bit because um, you have been led to do the work that you do through a, a myriad of personal experiences but they presented to you moments of great loss. They've presented to you moments of great mystery. And because you do help people go through grief and death and dying, nothing is more mysterious um, or uncomfortable, but you do it with such love and light and a commitment to like life. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I, I thank you. I appreciate what you both just said. So I think for me, um, so to your point, my dad died when I was nine, he was 39 years old, and the last day I saw him was Christmas Day. So a lot of people would say, oh my God, that's a terrible thing. And it took me a few years um, to kind of work through some of that, but then I came to this epiphany at some point that, well, wait a minute, if everybody has a last conversation, what was mine? And I remember this thing happened, it was this right and I was only nine years old but one would call it intuition one would call it one's intuitive sense and it was that something caused me to run to see my dad to say because my parents were separated run to see him and to grab my present from him and say thank you so much I love you and he said well honey I I love you too and he rolled up the window and that was our last conversation and it stuck in me, stuck in my head. They said, well, wait a minute. We're all going to have a last conversation. And so what, what if? And my life became this quest for, for meaning and purpose and with a, a, just an crazy um, curiosity, which led me to the fact that my son died. And my son died when he was 14 years old at age five. He was diagnosed with a rare neurodegenerative disease. And it wasn't that Austin died, it was that he suffered for 14 years. And so through that, he was cognitively intact. Through that, he stopped, you know, he, he was normal, quote, until he was five years old and stopped running and then moving his arms and then moving his legs. And then when he was nine, stopped swallowing and nine through 14 in bed until finally, um, I was in a situation with hospice's care to remove nutrition and hydration, which is the thing that I kept, begging God, please, anything, not that. But we made that decision. So to your point, Peter, it's about walking toward. It's about walking toward the thing that we most fear, toward the place that we're most uncomfortable. It's just like pruning a tree. Prune and then it grows. You prune and then it grows. I think it's the same thing with us. 
Yeah, I think that's really beautiful. Um, you know, we had talked about how you'd like to teach from Viktor Frankl's book, you know, saying yes to life. And so I wanted to ask you live because we have talked so much about love being a purpose or um, vulnerability being the key to, to more humanity. And I think that's what you're talking about so much, um, Diane, you really have been given so many different things in life that have just softened your heart, you know, like just made it like a yummy, <laughs> like the gooey center of a chocolate chip cookie. Like you're just so full of love through all that you have been through. And that's our choice, right? To go back to the original Viktor Frankl quote, like it's, we choose how we're going to react to something. And Zulai, who I know deeply personally, always chooses love. I don't know how you do it, um, but I wanted to ask you, how do you say yes to life and also blend that a little bit with the idea, you know, love being a purpose, your ultimate purpose, I think feels true to me about you. Your mic is, off, uh, is blocked. Got it, thank you for that. Um... I want to go back briefly to what Diane just said, because it really struck a chord with me, which is kind of what I wanted to impart on today's conversation, more of more as a student, not so much as a subject matter expert, because I'm not. Um, but you said pruning a tree and then it grows. So I, I equate that or or I think of that as the natural cycle of life, of life, death, life. And how society or just the way that we are um, branded or what's the word uh, just taught to be is that we're not to accept these natural occur these uh, natural um, cycles of life. So to me, it's not necessarily about finding meaning in every little thing. I think there's beauty in finding beauty in the mundane which brings me to a relationship too. You know, your a relationship is going to go through life and death experiences all the time, but it's up to us to find the love. It's like a question that I had that I was going to talk about on Modern News the other day is uh, I was watching a show the other day and a woman that was on the show spoke of love as merely a set of chemical reactions. And I disrespect, I mean, I respectfully disagree, rather. Um, I think love is a choice that you make every day. Through, through loving the way that um, life is unfolding, you can find the, the, the silver lining to find meaning in that and find direction and find new life in that, whether it's you know, I recently had a miscarriage. So how do I take that and not drown in the pain of that, but instead find the, the silver lining, the, if there is one, you know, this, you know, I could have a lot of people argue with me right now. I just read a, a blog that said, I hate when people say it's God's plan or, you know, it was meant to be. So you're left with all these unanswered questions when you're talking about all these things that we are that are ultimately out of our control. So I always come back to love being let it letting life unfold. And that doesn't mean that you're just that that we don't have choices and that we don't make them because we make choices every step of the way. But just looking at love and life in a more um, not not uh, not letting it be so restrictive. Like this is the way that things are supposed to be. And then when they don't happen that way, it's just really, like you said earlier, leaning into the things that are happening with love and allowing love to kind of guide you through, whether it be the pain, um, then, then there's a cycle of life where things are great and you, know, and you can share that love and you can share that joy, but there's also beauty in the death that occurs naturally in life. Did I ramble? No, no, it makes me think of 10,000 things. And by the way, for those of you that have not been on a panel before, like, yeah, lean into each other and I'm only here to I, help keep going. But but yeah, no, I, I really do agree with what you're saying. And I, and I think that Jeremy, you know, really you're kind of the perfect person to sort of pivot to because um, I think, and I am interested to share what the preemptive love coalition is with everybody, but also you as a man, 
have chosen from being a young man to, you know, maturing through the work that you do, you know, you've chosen to lean into love in a very complex world, but I'm sure that that has applied to your personal life, you know, as well. And so to go back to Zulai talking about, you know, how these are opportunities, they're openings, um, if I understood you correctly, you know, I do think the same thing for me. I, I asked you guys a question prior. I said, do you think about every day of life is your preparation for what is the inevitable, which is that, you know, we will all pass away at some point. So is every day a preparation for that? Is that, is it, that's the dance, you know, and it should give you more enthusiasm, not less enthusiasm. It's not, it shouldn't paralyze you to think about death. I like Diane have lost a lot of people. So I'm dancing with it. I choose that. But Jeremy, I think based on what Zulai said, I think um, my intuition is you have a lot to say on that. Well, thanks. And, and thank you for everyone who's gone so far. Beautiful thoughts and reflections from your own journey and your own life. Um, yeah, so for my context, the, the context of anything I'll say is obviously important for any of us. Um, I live in Iraq where I've lived with my family for the last 14, 15 years, a country that has for most of those years been officially at war and for all of those years been gravely affected by war. And of course, it's not just Iraq. Um, you know, much of our neighborhood is in conflict from Syria to Iran. Um, and then we've got uh, other places where we work around that seem to be sliding into conflict. And so our, our whole life as a family has largely been uh, a series of deliberate choices to place ourselves in conflict for the sake of others. And um, I love what, what Peter said about the, the notion of misplacing our faith um, as an alternative way of looking at hitting rock bottom or losing faith altogether. I think from my vantage point right now today, I would say that I've, I've never gone wrong in placing my faith in the goodness of who we can be for each other as neighbors, as brothers, as sisters, as cousins, as family, as strangers, um, which is not to say, believe me, it is not to say that in trusting who we have the potential to be for each other, we haven't been burned. We haven't suffered grave losses and setbacks. We've been shot at. We've been bombed. We've been arrested. We've been falsely accused. We've been, we've been through a lot. But man, what a way to go. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd choose any day of the week to be thrown in jail for believing the best about my neighbors than to live isolated and afraid and full of anxiety and fear because all I know how to do is see the worst in them. And it seems like as a country in the United States where many of us I imagine are calling in from, uh, but even the world more largely, we seem to be sliding further and further into our anxieties and our suspicions and our inability to take that risk of placing faith in each other and seem to be reverting to a much more tribalistic ostensibly safe place of fearing the worst in each other. Ironically, I, I suppose, is that we all get hurt in the end. No one makes it out of this thing unscathed. And so it really begs the question of, we're going to suffer loss. We're going to be betrayed. We're going to be misunderstood. How do we want to go down doing it with our fists up looking for a fight everywhere we go constantly suspicious of everyone or with our arms open taking the risk that 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 wound might come but how many hugs and love and embrace and kindness might come along the way because we've oriented ourselves for the love for the openness when you orient yourself for this i guarantee this is what you're going to get almost everywhere you go when you orient yourself for embrace you're going to get a lot more embrace than you ever knew was possible kelly hugh had asked me because she's never been on one of these before she said why did i create the respect project and i said well, the only way out is through. It's the only thing I know. I only know how to communicate. 
I don't do it perfectly. I don't offer that by doing this. I just know that deep communication has healed me. It's revealed my darkest secrets and brought them into the light. And by doing so, they've lost power over me. The things we keep inside, once we say them out loud, they're not as they're not like the boogeyman that we thought that they were. They don't control us anymore. It's the only way through to love each other more as friends or colleagues or lovers or in business. And um, so I agree with you. It's like it's it's the only it's the only way I I was like, to go back to Viktor Frankl. There was a beautiful quote. He said um, he said ultimately his purpose was to help others find their purpose because we're kind of our own, our roadmap of how we live and feel and experience life is really our offering to each other, right? You know, so I can only speak from the bandwidth of what I've ex experienced, but if I can talk about it honestly, and I can share that story here and that narrative, hopefully it gives people permission also to put their dukes down. You know what I mean? Drop the mask, stop the bullshit, <laughs> tell the truth. And this is why we do the respect talks is to tell the truth on behalf of each other. And so not to ever go back to a darker, darker way of looking at it. It's not really that it's actually what everybody else has said. It's like through the like needle, the, 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 the hole in the, in that thread, um, in that point of the needle, like it's this very minute way of like, how do you see the light? Um, Kelly Wolf, uh, you had talked about in your darkest hours, like how have you stayed somebody that's proactively always choosing the light? That's, yeah, that's something we were talking about that we wanted to talk about today. So I'm, I'm, I'm beyond humbled by listening to all of you. Jeremy, in particular, you just said the thing about um, talking about having your dukes up. And I think about this often in my work that I've almost never come across a true sociopath. I think it's, um, 0 0.01 or maybe even less than that of the actual population. Like people want to love, people want to do good. And if you really go looking, that's usually what you find. And if you find the sociopath that can talk people into doing their bidding, then that might be them operating out of fear. But I believe that the core value of humanity is that we, we are loving beings at our absolute <laughs> Nature. So to answer your question, and Peter, I was thinking about you when you said this, like my revelation, my moment of recognizing faith as a general concept came from when my body betrayed me. So, you know, where I, I, I terrible diagnosis, I thought things were going to go one way. They actually went another way. So that's beautiful. Um, but I created a process called flow that stands for finding love over worry. So it, it leads to everything that you guys are talking about, which is it's a choice, you know? I mean, we can choose our thoughts and then the thoughts are our, um, our experience, right? So we forget that the thoughts are the things that create so much of our suffering and so much of our pain are simply just our thoughts. And then when we take on the recognition that that's a choice, holy mind blow. Now you can rewrite the entire thing in, in, in like a second, you know? And for me, the work that I do, I always say I'm like the chicken nugget version. Like I'm the palatable, oh, you can remember finding love over worry. And then when you do that, you'll find like potentially, hopefully a much deeper dive to keep choosing love. It's like what Jeremy said, I'm your company, love anyway love anyway and believe at your core that the percentage of humans walking the earth that want to do people harm is so minuscule it's almost impossible right so like we just have to have faith we have to have faith that love is our defining nature you know and that anytime we're veered off of it it's usually because we have given into fear because we have given in to worry and that's my core mission is by the love of all things holy, don't do it, <laughs> you know? Stay connected to flow, make that other choice because the more that we are collectively doing that, I mean, just feel the energy of just these, this little group right here, you know? It's so powerful and recognizing that every person's story, I mean, Diane, you brought me to tears. It's like, I have three young children. That's our greatest fear that we lose, right? I mean, what we can overcome by choosing love anyway. Wow. Powerful. Okay. So 
No, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, and Kelly Hugh, I know we wanted to talk a little bit about this sort of goes into, of course, and everything we're saying, you know, in that sort of sense that, you know, we're preparing we're comfortable with the idea of death and dying and preparing for death so so to speak every day of our life that has given you a lot of gratitude and enthusiasm for like making this day the best day or at least that's how i heard it when we were communicating about that um so yeah i mean choosing that love anyway but you know through the lens of you know gratitude for what this moment is for us and there's no guarantee for tomorrow either mm. I think, I think to your point, you know, Kelly, what you were just saying, and, and everyone else, quite actually, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was the preeminent author, she wrote this book on death and dying, on grief and grieving, and 24 others. She was friends with Viktor Frankl, and I sit on uh, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation board, and the genesis of Elizabeth's work was not about death. It was that there are basically two human emotions, love and fear. And all actions come from love or fear. And once we understand that almost all action comes from love or fear, you also boil it down then further and you say, okay, what is it about another person that I love? I and I have asked hundreds of patients this, and it's, it's always, it's, it's how they treated me, their sense of humor, the interactions between us, that's energy. So love is energy. And what is energy? It's neither created nor destroyed. It's around us all the time. So love is everywhere all the time. Even if to your question, the what happens? Is it all a step forward towards death? I don't think it is. Because I think that there is no soul transplant. Now, modern medicine teaches us that the, you know, they try to make death all about what happens to the medical process. But there is no soul transplant. Not a single person, a physician can measure the soul. Well, the soul is 2.2 centimeters by 3.5 centimeters, so therefore. So I think every single person on this panel is sort of orchestrating this amazing symphony that's called love. And we're doing it in different ways. And maybe we tweak our language a little differently, but it's harmonic. And we know that energetically, love vibrates, vibrates really high. And I do think that it's very healing for our world to go back to Kelly, your concept of flow. And the brain teaches us that resiliency happens by continuing to practice. And choosing love over fear takes a lot of practice. Even Viktor Frankl, to your point, knew that. Yeah, and that's why I was saying to Kelly Hugh, um, you know, how, you know, how have you managed to pull that off? Because you are that force as well. Everybody here is, and I know it takes effort and I know it's, I listen, I said to each of you guys before we jumped on today, I am not having a good day. I like, it's been a difficult week. Um, so I know, but you are Kelly Hugh so much that, and so I want to talk to you a little bit, um, about how you managed to pull that off. I think so much of it is just perspective, right? You know, like Kelly was saying that we we choose how we we look at things. You know, I think um, one of the best examples for me, um, uh, somebody was asking me, you know, what is the most difficult thing that you're going through right now? Like, what is the one thing that you would change? And at, the, at that time I was thinking, you know, I would love to have a better relationship with my mother. You know, it was like everything else in my life was great, but every time I connected with my mother, you know, she comes from a completely different side of the spectrum when it comes to politics and everything. Um, and so it, it, it gets really difficult sometimes to communicate. But I realized that, you know, she is 82 years old. I, there's nothing that I can do that's going to change her as a person. Um, all I could do was change my perspective of how I saw her and how I communicated with her. And, um, and when I made that conscious choice to, to just step back and not take everything so personally and really just kind of change perspective, not only did it change my way of looking at her, but it ended up changing her as a person too in the way that we communicated because then it wasn't as though everything was a jab or everything was taken in the wrong context. 
um, you know, I think if we allow that, if we if we walk around with more openness and give more people the benefit of the doubt, figure out where they're coming from instead of being judgmental, you know, it's like, oh, well, they're a Trump supporter, so I'm not, you know, going to like them as a person. I think we need to get away from that kind of tribal thinking, you know, and, and really see people stripped away from all of that for who they are. And, and I think everybody wants to be vulnerable, wants to be allowed to be vulnerable. And, um, and if you give them that opportunity, I think that, um, you know, just kind of sit back and respect their perspective as well. Um, it, it allows us to just all get along so much better. Yeah, I definitely think um, when we tell our story, we give permission to other people to tell theirs. And um, and so, Peter, Peter Arthur, I just want to ask you, um, you know, what does keep you inspired, regardless of what's going on? I mean, where do you what do you tap into? Where is your what's what's the where's your superpower <laughs> that you lean into when when you're sliding? Um, well, for me, um, and. And then like everyone else saying, I was listening to the panelists, I was listening to Diane and Kelly, and Jeremy, and I, I guess I have to mention everyone, right? So it's too many points that you guys made that that was relevant to, um, you know, to my life and to some of the things that happened, um, like Jeremy making the point um, about um, looking at, even in, in, a, in light of uh, threatening conditions, you can choose a certain character or a certain level of dignity um, that you can have in those moments. Um, and um, listening to Diane, you know, talking about, um, you know, looking at things in terms of a, a perspective, almost like a garden, tending to it. Um, for me, sliding, I actually look back, to be honest with you, at, at younger people. Um, a lot of times we can get caught up in our and where we are and what we've grown into um, and what we know of the world. And a lot of things that take place and happen and that we benefit from don't necessarily come from or doesn't necessarily come from from our our group or our generation. Sometimes we're the we're the moderators of a lot of young people that have everything to do with changes that's upcoming in the world. Um, and we have wisdom, we can move and shape them and that, that inspires me to do that. I like being around young minds. Um, I spent many years in the military grooming and mentoring people, but also being kept alive by their perspectives, their way they look at the world. Too often we have these little glib conclusions about millennials, this or that. It's really disingenuous and it's pretty, it's a big bias about where we are in our lives. Um, I have a lot of faith in young people and I think they are going to determine, they're, they're gonna determine the world and you can help kind of move and shape that. So I, my faith comes from who's coming up after me. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and to sort of refer back to your, the accident that you had I'll never forget the story you told. I don't know if you were on the love panel or the courage panel or something, but you talked about how you just saw that hand being reached out to you in that moment. And that is all that you saw and that is all that you felt. And so you are that person, Peter, that looks back and, you know, and is throwing your hand out to other people, including I think the younger generation. And like you said, let's not write them off. They're being, they're going through more right now than we ever have could have imagined going through. And I have a feeling they're going to be a pretty significant generation because of it. So. Well, I want to, I want to add to that point you made. Um, when when uh, Elizabeth talked about the hand, what it is when I was laying on the highway, I, I taking my last breath seemingly. Um, and Diane, you mentioned it. I think Kelly, you mentioned this, the energy. In that moment, I'm in the medical field myself. So in that moment, from that highway to the ambulance to the trauma center, the one thing that the doctors written off, that the nurses written off, was 
the very experienced medical professionals putting defibrillators on me, putting trauma, putting medicine, putting all these things in me. And what I, can I tell you today that kept me alive was those moments where some nurse with all their skills and all the other things they could tend to responded to my request to hold my finger and hold my hand to help me keep myself alive. So my point to that is many people can't measure the spirit. Diane, you said it beautifully and I felt this. They can't measure your spirit, but with their faculties, with their nose, their eyes, their voice, they can do everything to change it and move it. And that is what people don't have faith in is their own cells. The nurse had faith in her stethoscope and that doctor had faith in his lab coat, but he didn't have faith in himself to back up my healing with his human faculties. So that was where my experience uh, came in. And, and it's a message that sticks with me and I try to pass on. It, it reminds me, thank you, Peter. I love you so much. I mean, I got to take a moment just to say, like, I know a lot of you deeply personally and I, and those that I don't, I just, I really am always so humbled to have this conversation um, and that everybody that comes to this talk is always doing it on behalf of other people. And, and so this quote, I, I think of a lot by Maya Angelou, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel about themselves. And I would like to turn to Zulai for a quick second and just ask you, because I do think of you as somebody that is always loving. I don't know, it just seems that way to me. But I mean, how do you say yes to life? Like you, you, are, you are to me somebody that has chosen to with whatever your personal suffering, whatever your personal pain or whatever you've been through, you've chosen to uh, really, hold the light for other people. I'm just so touched by what Peter just said. I'm trying to um, digest that. And he reminds me so much of, people always ask, you know, in interviews or questions or just in passing, they say things like, who, who is your hero or who is the person that you look up to the most? And I have to say, and I've always had this answer, but as a young kid, I didn't really understand it. It's my mom. And the thing about my mom that makes her so incredibly special is just goes back to everything Peter just said. There is a certain level of humanity that most of us are afraid to tap into because it's too vulnerable. It's too, it's too scary. It's too, you know, we, we don't want to look, we don't want people to look at us a certain way. It's, it's, it's a scary thing to be vulnerable and to lean into people. But the story that Peter just told really just explains it in such a way to me that I'm so moved and I'm so touched. My mom doesn't see, she said it to me the other day, and it's funny, um, Kelly, Hugh, you mentioned the whole thing. This is politics aside, but there are really, it, people just have circumstances that have made them that way. There's been circumstances that have shaped and molded people in certain ways. But if we could look past all of those circumstantial things that we don't even know what they are, we don't know people, but if we just understand people on a human level and what um, Kelly Wolf was saying that we're, we're mostly all good and if we lean into our own humanity and we see it in ourselves, we're going to be able to see it in other people. You know, that's just kind of, and that's, and I get so um, shaken up to the core when I talk about it, because it really, I think collectively, this is where we are. Collectively, we're being called to kind of examine that within ourselves and then show up for each other in that way. Um, so Peter, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to have met you, all of you, but the story you just told about the doctor and the nurse and having, taking, like you said, our human faculties and really understanding that we are here for, to learn about each other, to help each other, that we're here to um, become the best version of ourselves every day we're never going to it's not there's 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 this isn't a destination that we have to get to but collectively we're being called to be more human 
to be more of who we were meant to be. And that is what we do through kindness, how we show up for a complete stranger, for a patient, for our friends, and stop being so damn judgmental, myself included. Oh my God. <laughs> I just wanna take a moment, just to, just a moment of silence, just for a second, you guys. Thank you so much. Whew. Diane, my love, um, I think a lot of what we're saying is about how, you know, we are able to turn our life's experience into, a, you know, into a purpose to help others, right? That's our, where our greatest vulnerability, our greatest humanitarianism, our greatest strength lies. And so, you know, I want to ask you, how do you say yes to life? I know that is your ultimate purpose. And as we've talked many times on some hard days for me, you always are about finding that affirmative um, enthusiasm for life. Well, I would say I try. I'm very human, like everyone else, you know. Um, I think like everyone on this panel, I think there are days when we say, oh God, did I really have to mess up on that way? Or uh, my humanity is like ah, all out there. But with that said, I think to go back to what was just said about humanity, it's also in and being judgmental. It's about looking at judgment comes from fear. And I think 100% of the time, we do not judge what we do not fear, period, full stop. So when we are judgmental, there also comes this little life lesson. So what you were saying is when bad stuff happens, how do we turn it into meaning making? When we have a loss, how do we turn it into meaning making? Whether, and bless you, and I'm so sorry about your miscarriage. And, and, and just what do we do from here? I think many of us have gone through things where we just are consumed with the what, what from here? What could possibly come from here? And Americans especially are very hardwired to go, okay, well now I'm gonna make a meeting out of this and now I'm gonna do this and here's my new meeting, ah, oh, Aria. But really there's nothing wrong with saying pause. Just catch a breath. And I do think that the meaning comes in seasons. What is, all of our meaning in this season for whatever we're experiencing could very well shift to a meaning of a different type in a different season. I've miscarried or my son died or someone else has miscarried and they take it and go in this direction. So we might have similar circumstances, but I think the key to all of it is exploring what does yes me to each of us but often that only happens in the space that is the pause not the space that is full-on rocket speed ahead because that sort of has its own crash trajectory <laughs> but i think we pause and in recognizing that it's okay to be still for those that are on here that are religious based being still is a part of scripture for those that are not being still as an energetic practice, we know has great, tremendous importance. That too is saying, yes, yes, I'm choosing to be still. Yes, I choose to pause. Because then when the meaning comes in and it does come, accepting that whatever the meaning is for this season, then we go forward. And I think that too is saying yes. And we say yes until we're ready to hit pause. And pause can sometimes co come after the heels of a no. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. It's making me think about so much why I even created the Respect Project because there's something sort of unknown about how all of this is going to go. You're bringing diverse people together with different stories, different backgrounds, and you're asking them to have a respectful, vulnerable conversation that is anchored in mutual respect, but also self-respect. 
And there's a big pause in that. There's a big unknown in that. And I never know how it's going to turn out, you know? And that's really sort of the, that's sort of the experience life, what life is like, you know, we don't really know how it's going to turn out. You know, we just, we need to, you know, commit to being comfortable with the discomfort or like Wilkie said, I, and I think of this a lot, like living the question. That's what the pause is to me, Diane. Mm. Living the question and the mystery of it all and your purpose changes and your faith changes, you know? Because I could now ask each of you all the same questions. You've heard them all already before. I just want to take a moment to say, um, William Bridge, who's the CEO of Global Green is here. He said he wants to thank all of you for this conversation and just to reiterate you know how he we are all in this together and with a lot of gratitude for everybody here that's talking so openly with each other well i guess ultimately right it's like people who start the conversation are just doing it so everybody else can step in um jeno wants to talk about love um the idea that love is a very subjective thing based on each person's worldview how do we teach people um, that ultimate love that we're talking about here. And it comes back to what is love in the world perspective. Um, so do any of you want to take that question? Um, anybody here want to talk about that? I think, uh, I think I could, I could read, you know, people, I often, I can feel the spirit of that question. And it's often a question where I feel like Diane, you said it again. Um, when someone asks a question like that, although it, it sounds hopeful, sometimes I feel like it's a, a question of despair and people are really almost asking, what do you do next? Those questions are fearful questions. I think sometimes people don't trust the collective, um, their, their, their aggregate um, ability to change things. What do you do next? What do you do? What do I'm going to personally do next? Sometimes we ask that as the world is going to fix it. We we're asking it outwardly. You know, when something goes wrong in our community, you say, what is the mayor going to do? What is the, or something goes wrong in, in even a smaller friendship. You ask what that friend needs to change. You, you challenge the other person, but rarely do you, it's easier to challenge other people. Um, you know, Challenging other people to me is like pulling weeds. It doesn't make you a gardener, but challenging yourself and looking inside, that takes a lot of tending to, because you know what's there? It's jealousy, it's fear, it's, it's, it's being upset, it's, 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 it's all of those, it's having um, not confidence, lack of confidence. That's a lot of gardening. And that is a skill that you have to work on for yourself. So, if you want to ask something out with the world, I think it's appropriate to kind of turn it into and do an inventory where you are, if you're healthy enough in the mind to do that. Thanks, Peter. Um, I want to take a moment just to say that, Kelly Hugh, a lot of people here are talking about what you shared in regards to your mom. It really touched a nerve for a lot of people. Diane Gray knows a lot of personal stuff I'm going through right now with my daughter. Um, so it is very deep. It's hard when it's a very deep, deep personal relationship, an emotional relationship to stay in that place. So I'll just read from Rod to you, Kelly. I too have a less than ideal relationship with my mom as well as, um, and I would like to do better. What did you change in how you react to your mother when your mother is being your mother? <laughs> it's all about triggers and trying to give her the benefit of the doubt, which is so hard. And he's not the only one who said thanks for talking about that topic. I think what I did was I, um, I didn't think of her as being my mother per se, but just as another human being. I tried to treat her as just, give her the same respect that I would have a friend. You know, I noticed that I would be more sensitive with her than I would with, a friend, if a friend were to say something, and also just allowed, I would laugh more with her and sort of, if she said something that I thought was a bit of a dig, I wouldn't, I would try really hard not to take it personally and just kind of laugh it off and let her also kind of bring her into the, the joke, the humor, allow her to 
um, I, I, I realized how funny my mother actually is. I didn't give her permission to be funny before. And now that I have this different like way of looking at her and different way of communicating with her, there's so much more humor and so much more laughter that I've been able to find in the relationship that it's actually changed her as a person as well, I think, you know, at least the way we communicate. So just I think the way that I did it was just allowing her to be fun, funny, more vulnerable. And um, I also forgave her, um, not just in my heart, but but verbally forgave her because, um, you know, she she didn't make some, some of the best choices in life, but I made her understand that I realized that she only had the tools that she had and she made the best of, you know, what she could at the time. And when I said that to her, she said, yes, yes, yes. And, and I think that was like, a breaking point, you know, that just kind of allowed her to be a person vulnerable. Because I think what happens is we put our, our parents on this pedestal and we expect them to be so perfect and have made all these perfect choices. But when you allow them to just be human, um, then I think that it allows the relationship to, to evolve into something different. I think that's, that's, so that's so wise. You know, I, I feel that we do the same thing to our primary relationship, our romantic relationship, whereas friendship is, you know, as Yogananda, if you know who that is, he said, it's the most spiritual relationship because we don't have any expectations of each other, you know, and we just go to each other to fill each other's cup and then we go back home, you know, so friendship is this extraordinary love. And we put the same pressure on our romantic relationships as well to be everything. And then somehow it snaps under, it can snap under that pressure. Um, just to go back to some of the questions, um, Liz Svatek said, um, please some practical tips from when you are in an extreme state of fear that can move you into love. Again, everybody here is really it, talking a lot to you guys. If you wanna look at the questions as well. Um, anybody want to take that, you know, when you're really sort of faced with you, you're the pressure cooker. I feel like Jeremy, you need to answer this question. Um, how do you go back to love when you're in like the deepest state of fear? Too late. I mean, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's too late. You've got to practice it well before you get to that point. I don't mean that, you know, you can never find your way out, but if, if you're just getting started or just trying to figure it out when you're already at that heightened fight or flight kind of place. I mean, physiologically, your adrenaline's pumping and your a fear is not just an idea. Um, we've kind of moved in and out of the, the dynamic or the relationship here on this call between physiology and you know, psychology, the, the ideas that shape us. But there's also a, a biological thing that goes on in us that, that we can't totally discount either. Can we? deploy ideas to control physiology. Yes, we, we can, but you've got to start these practices long before you're in that heightened state of, of fear or trigger or trauma or so that as you move into those spaces, you've got a sense of rhythm and exercise and discipline to it that you already know how to do. It's like picking up the guitar. It's like riding a bike. You know, you already know what the movements are that you need to do to stay between the lines, so to speak. And um, I think a lot of us don't put in the hours of practice and we don't put in the hours on stage to press the guitar metaphor a little bit. Like we will we'll practice on the mat, the yoga mat, so to speak, or, you know, we'll like, we'll do the inner mind work or I'm pressing all kinds of metaphors here together, but then we won't ever, I'm going back to the guitar here. Then we won't, <laughs> then we won't ever take it out into a public performance kind of situation where we're actively engaged in being around people who are different than us, pressing into service with and to people that trigger us or may want to harm us. So we live this kind of bifurcated life. And I think part of what our life as humanitarian peacemakers has taught us is it's got to be, maybe I shouldn't say it's got to be, I'll say life is richest when it's both. When you've got that, that inner life and that private kind of 
closet life that you're you're alone with yourself and comfortable and doing your practice and doing your disciplines but then when you take that out into the world into public places that are not just populated with your friends but are populated with extreme levels of diversity that that would challenge you and that may in fact want to harm you and you bring your brilliance into those places and and try to see what it's like to shine in those places that you maybe once feared. So I think that that public service, or I use the word performance in a different way, but you know, public service and private practice, I think is the, that's how you perform in love when you're in those hard spots, but you can't, you can't just conjure it up in the moment. No, I, I agree with you, Jeremy. I mean, I, you know, Kelly Hewitt asked me before we started this, why I had created the respect project. And I said, quite honestly, because although I see myself as a very bright, light, purposeful person, you know, I recognize deep disappointment and despair and suffering inside of myself. And they run the gambit of family relationships and professional aspects of my life and spiritual, what have you, it doesn't really matter. This is not about that. It's more to say that, you know, when we use ourselves uh, as a template for more empathy and compassion on a daily hourly basis, then we have the ability, like you said, we're practiced when the pressure cooker of fear is really, excuse my French, fucking on, you know, because we've been practicing it and practicing it. And, and I think that that's where compassion and empathy really comes from is using our life and with complete transparency as a way to have an understanding of each other that's um, gentle and, and you know, um, brave on behalf of each other because we've had to be that for ourselves, but we have to do that for ourselves and be practiced in that um, because it is very hard not to respond to fearful moments with, a, 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 you know, with a, you know, with the reaction of fear and to go into love if we haven't been practicing it for ourselves. Every time I do a respect talk, it's always about self-love. Somehow we always get back to self-love. Um, and, uh, but I do think it's the daily practice um, that we bring into the world, whether it's as humanitarians or just, you know, as human beings walking down the, down the road. Um, Malik Yoba has joined us. I know there were some issues going on technically, so thanks. I'm so happy you're here. You kind of can see where we're headed. We're kind of going to be wrapping up in 15 minutes, but um, Malik, you and I were talking a lot about, um, you know, we've talked a lot about firstly, we've been friends for so long, over 20 years. I mean, the meaning of life for you, oftentimes you've expressed to me is helping others find meaning and much to what I was just saying, Sometimes, you know, the only gift we have is our own life experience as a way to help navigate relationships with other people. And um, ultimately, navigating relationships with other people is really the name of the game <laughs> because uh, getting through this thing uh, called life means we have to recognize each other with respect. Um, talk to me a little bit about what that sort of resonates for you. And you've already been introduced, by the way. Everybody knows who you are. So, David. Hello, everyone. So I, I guess respect talk starts with me saying I'm sorry for my tardy for, you, tardy for the party. Uh, and if I'm completely transparent, it's because I was literally reviewing my film I've been editing for the last few months and literally lost track of time and looked up and was like, oh, shit, I'm supposed to be with Liz. So we get to practice what we're preaching about. So I apologize uh, for my tardiness, for being distracted by a piece that's intended to help people. You know, it's a, a hopefully an inspiring, inspiring documentary on the real estate business, uh, particularly for people of color who uh, don't really have a way in often. Um, and so I'm, I'm opening the door for other people to follow, you know, my activity. Um, but if we are bringing our life experiences to the party and we're only referring or referencing other people's experiences, then we're really, what are we doing? If I'm hearing you correctly, what was, you know, it sounded like Jeremy was talking about something similar uh, before that question you just asked me about <clears throat> doing the work and in a constant state of, you know, who am I? What am I? Who am I now? 
what do I feel? What do I think? Why do I think this way? What is, not oh, not analyzing to the point of paralysis, but being self-reflective enough to um, know that we don't know everything and that we have to remain seeking spirits. And I think, you know, at least for the work I've been doing, you know, it's in, you know, Gary Zukov's book, The Seed of the Soul, but the therapist said to me years ago, the alignment of the soul and the personality. Um, I think I have the soul of a saint. My personality <laughs> might be a whole bunch of other shit, you know, but it's like, how do you align, you know, yourself with yourself, with your highest self and, and find that balance. Um, so uh, I, I think I might've answered some of your question. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, we're just, we're just rolling, rolling in it. We were just talking about, you know, I had started the talk with a quote saying that everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, which is to choose. We have the right to choose how we react ultimately, right? Our attitude, how we react. And my mom used to say something she to me when I was little, she said, I hope you always tell the truth, but for God's sakes, don't lie to yourself. You Amen. know, so the conversation here is always about being transparent on behalf of other people. Um, you guys, we're going to wrap up in about 15 minutes. So if you have any further questions, um, but I wanted to sort of get to you, Kelly Wolf, a little bit more because we've talked so much about gratitude um, and, you know, sort of using that as a tool to just, you know, continue um, to find love anyway, to quote Jeremy Courtney's documentary, which again, I hope you guys will go see. It's it's phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, Jeremy, you said something that just got me too, when you're like, it's too late, when you're already in the fear bucket. And it just made me think like, you know, I'm going to be the girl that cried flow. My last name's Wolf, which is flow spelled backwards, which is kind of amazing. But I always feel like worry is the gateway drug to fear and to all those other things that when you chronically get trapped on your thoughts, you chronically get trapped in worry when you can apply, whether it's a flow practice or Byron Katie or Gary Zukoff or whoever it is, when you start to apply those methods of choosing, you know, in the, in the flow matrix, it's finding is on purpose. That's becoming the observer. That's seeing that you are having these thoughts to begin with. The O is over. That's the choice part. That's going, Oh my God, like the other day, I'm just on a trail worrying about what's for dinner, worrying about who's supposed to pick up the kids, worrying about, you know, all the goofy stuff that we worry about. I'm like, whoa, there I go. I am like, I am on the loop train. And then you stop it. And the more you stop it to Jeremy's point, that's the practice. That was the spiritual abs that you had to get before you were in the actual ring of the battle, right? Like we can't expect to wake up and have abs. I mean, I still don't have someday y'all someday. Um, but it, it's the same thing with the spiritual abs. I think we have to keep working that muscle so that when we find ourselves in big T trauma, like what Jeremy's talking about with the fear, when you're in big T trauma, you're going to now need to get, you know, clinical help for sure. Please, 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 you guys do that. When you're in big T trauma, do that. It's accessible in so many ways now. But when it's little T and when it's worry, oh man, you can become the most badass purveyor of getting over that stuff so that when the big stuff happens and the big stuff, I think every single one of us here has defined, the big stuff is going to happen. It is unavoidable. If you are saying yes to life, if you are here, if you are taking breath, the big stuff is coming for you. So I'm always like, guys, do, do the flow, do the the work, do the things when things are kind of okay, you know, pick that, pick that day. So yes, I am a daily chooser of gratitude when the worry isn't buckling my knees because it, when I've gotten to that point, oh man, I need every structural piece that I have got to, to look back on. So I'm more of like the, oh, I'm so worried my friend didn't call me back. Okay, let's work on that, <laughs> you know, instead of waiting for the big dog. Can I just add something to that? Because I, I love what Kelly and Jeremy both said. Obviously, there is a, a practice. There is um, something that we have to work towards to creating th this kind of um, cushion, for lack of a better word. But for me, and this works for me, um, I 
if, if we're if if I want to offer the, the the person who asked the question just something just something that could be tangible in moments of deep shit fear, which works was which has worked for me and it may not work for you, but I I feel that we all have a part of us, our soul, um, Diane, that you mentioned earlier, that is untouchable. It's so we still. It's never fearful. It's always in perfect harmony, because that's that's our true self and I and this is just something I developed for myself very recently in the last two years and I find that if I just tune into that and I acknowledge it in myself and I and it's like be still and know that I am God and I know that that's a very it's a, you could we, we, we could unpack that it doesn't have to be religious but just being still and understanding that there is indeed a part of you that can't be touched that is in, always in complete harmony and that has brought me complete, not complete, but solace and has, has brought me um, to a place where I've been able to calm myself enough to make rational decisions, to, to kind of move forward from the fear and, and take a step in the right direction. So while I agree with both of you, I, that's something that's worked for me. And I wanted to share that um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the participant. I'm glad that you said that, you know, I didn't shy away from keeping the faith because I was afraid to get into the question of faith. Um, so I'm really glad you said that because maybe I said keeping the faith because I do have a very strong personal faith in God. Um, but ultimately, as I analyzed why I wanted to have this conversation with you guys, it was about finding man's woman's search for meaning and how to have purpose. I keep coming back to that thought. And we're, what we're talking about is exercising how to, to be purposeful and maintain the light in the face of fear and holding that on behalf of others. And that's kind of what's amazing about these conversations. They take a lot of twists and turns. Um, so, you know, but I do, I want to, I'm glad you talked about faith. I mean, do you consider yourself to be a spiritual person, Peter, as faith led you in your life or, you know, and, and, and not to ask you a religious question, um, but, you know, finding that center, you know, what that untouchable part of you is, does that, does that come into play into all the stuff that we've been talking about today? Now, I, I do consider myself to be a spiritual person. When I say get into the idea of religious person, I think it starts a lot of arguments and uh, discord amongst people and the way it's practiced and what you're up to. And it, it can, it can bring a lot of the a lot of the uh, more basic uh, um, worst parts of us. But when I say spiritual, um, I, I was, when I was in the hospital before I had my leg amputated, not before the week of say the amputation, um, many of my, I decided I needed to cut off because it was crushed too, it was too much, it was too extreme. And uh, when it was finally cut off, one of the probing questions from my friends was, well, how do you feel now that it's gone? Do you still feel like you're yourself, like you're a man? And it's interesting. And um, this adaptation is out there in the world in many books it's written. But one of the things I realized is, Jeremy, you hit on this too. It depends on how you ordered your character before I got into the situation. This is Jeremy's point. I, I, it, it struck me. So my response to my friends were, if I manage my life by the material world and my faith came behind that, then the material world will inform how I felt and then I would be crushed because my pride and my ego, my manhood would be wrapped up in who I previously was. But if my spirituality and my sense of spirit informs the material world, then it would give me the strength and endurance to stand up and keep moving in spite of what happened to me materially. Mm. So you would have had to have that leading up to that moment. And if it's being introduced to you at that point, you're now beginning the journey to learn and cope. And I guess that's where therapists help and that's where coaches help. But you see, it's still, it's showing that it's work either way. So you can have it leading into it, 
or you need to get it really freaking fast once if you want to come out of it. So that's my perspective on that. Peter, as as always, every time you're on the panel, it's like, I mean, let's just drop the mic right there. I honestly think that fully encompasses everything that I wanted to talk about, everything I believe to be true from my own personal pain, my own personal experiences and how I wanna thrive in life. I don't wanna just survive, I wanna thrive. And so I want to let my personal history inform how I conduct myself every single day of my life. But it's not easy. And as a community, as a humanity, we come together and hopefully inspire that in each other. So thank you. I love you so much. I would love each of you so much who are here today. Um, if there's anything you want to ask each other, everybody here that's with us has thanked you guys so, so deeply. Um, you can scroll through. Steve Valentine has said, thank you for reminding me that we're all more alike than not. And that's the name of the game. I think self-respect and mutual respect is sort of what we have to really lean into the most, you know, because that helps us to feel more connected to each other. Um, anything else you guys want to talk about before we jump off and hopefully have <laughs> wherever you are, have the best day possible. Kelly Gallagher is saying, love it, love it. I mean, everybody's just like, thank you guys. Over to you. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, thank you. All right. Well, Kelly Wolf, Kelly Hugh, Peter Arthur, Malik Yoba, Jeremy Courtney, Diane Gray, Zulai Hanoa. I love you guys. Thank you for taking the time to have a conversation. And thank you guys for being here with us and listening and driving us with questions. Um, we will be doing our next Respect Talk February 21st on the topic of keeping calm in chaos. Um, so I hope you'll join us. I will uh, be sharing that information with you and really much love. It is not easy to be a human being, but we are here to have a spiritual experience. And so, you know, just keep, keep the light bright and um, much respect until next time.